Hello, Anne. How are you? Okay. Yes, I'm okay. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Thank you. It's fine. Great. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to talking no, to you. That's lovely for me. Thank you. Yes, great. And uh, I know that this conversation could take a few directions. So, <laughs> um, you know, the width and breadth of your knowledge and um, wisdom is, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. <laughs> So this journey that I've been on, um, which I think is a collective journey for many, um, is around, uh, I've used the word women, so anybody that identifies as a woman finding their voice, but really the more and more I, v I venture on this, it's the feminine principle coming forwards more. Um, and uh, yeah. yeah, I would love to um, begin by just setting a little bit of sacred space to honour this conversation but also to honor the um the elements in the earth so if that's all right i'll just take a moment and um yeah, yeah create this sacred space and really to begin with this earth that we're on and all that she brings to honour the animals, to honour each and every being, unseen and seen, to honour the stones, the plants, the trees, and of course sun, moon, and all aspects that are here with us now. Thank you. That was lovely. So, Anne, I would love to begin with um, hearing a bit more about your story. Of course, I've read and uh, researched about you since I got your book last year, um, but it's much better coming from the person <laughs> themselves. Well, I was born um, in 1931 and had an uneventful sort of childhood going between England and France, where my grandmother had a lovely house in the south of France. Then the war intervened and I went to America just before it started and stayed there throughout the whole period of the war. Uh, then I came back to Europe and began my English education and um, went to school and university. And then I had an amazing adventure, really, through just fortuitous, but there never are fortuitous contacts in Rome. I, was, I got a job uh, collecting photographs from all the museums in Asia, uh, which was included in India at that time, everywhere except China, where I couldn't go. So I, for two years, really, I had a marvelous um, exploration of these Eastern cultures. Uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, and the marvelous art connected with those um, religions, and also the people who were utterly delightful. It was before the age of hippies. There was no uh, real danger, and I was passed from hand to hand, from country to country with contacts, and the museums were wonderful and gave me what I wanted without asking to be paid, everywhere except Japan, which was difficult because the language was very, very difficult and getting around Tokyo was very difficult. But otherwise, I had no problems at all. And so I came back with, instead of having sent my photographs to Italy, and I was able to pay back a £250 loan that I'd had <laughs> from a boyfriend. And in those days, £250 was a lot of money. Now it's nothing, really. But anyway, with that, I got from place to place without borrowing any more and had an extraordinary time, which opened my mind and my heart to these other ways of looking at life. And of course, I heard about reincarnation, I heard about karma, I heard about um, Taoism and the connection with nature, and I, I learned about Buddhism. In fact, I was asked by a Buddhist monk to come and stay in a monastery in Thailand, but I wasn't ready, so I, I said, thank you, I'm not ready yet. 
So that was the basic sort of foundation for all my future work. And then um, I came back to England and was bored out of my mind because the only jobs available to women then were secretary or a teacher or a nurse. And it was not what I wanted to do. None of them was what I've been good at and none of them did I want to do. So um, I wrote a book called The One Work which was about my journey to the East and which is now being republished by an American publisher this year, which is very nice. All of a sudden out of the blue, they asked me if they could. And then I embarked on a Jungian analysis because I had a lot of depression, probably from having had my life opened so widely and then having it closed down again, not knowing what to do or, how, or where to go sort of thing. And that opened my um, mind or my understanding to the Jungian concept of the unconscious and how we are connected at a deep level with the unconscious, all of us, and how we can be trained to listen to what the what he called the voice of the depths, such a beautiful expression, as opposed to the voice of the times, which is the ego's voice and the, the voice of the world that we live in. So that took me many years of training, and then I trained as a union analyst and practiced myself for about 20 years. <clears throat> then I resigned from my association and began to write, because I'd already started writing uh, with Jules Cashford, The Myth of the Goddess, in the 1980s. And that was a huge work which took us 10 years and took us back into all the cultures in the European, in the West, as it were, that had worshipped the goddess. That is today Egypt and uh, Sumeria, Greece, Rome. And so we trace the image of the goddess all the way through from the Paleolithic era, which nobody knew about at that time. And only Joseph Campbell, who was, I was just saying today to my husband, he was a most marvelous writer, a genius, without a doubt. And he wrote about the um, Paleolithic era and the Neolithic, as well as all his other books, which we drew on very heavily. And there were other books which people don't know about now. There were books about the moon, wonderful book about the moon. There was all Messiah Eliad's works about um, the meaning of, of myth and things. So we had a very rich library to draw on and we put it all together. It took us a long time, but we, we did it. And it was published um, again by a fluke because um, Jules's partner happened to know the editor of Penguin who would have commissioned it. And he had lunch with her and, and he said, what about the book that we sent you six months ago? She said, book, what book? And then she fished into a drawer and pulled it out. And that's how it got published. <laughs> uh, so these things that happen, there's something helping us. And I should say that at the very beginning of my life, in my um, sort of very early teens, I had a mother who did channel messaging. And we had messages, or she had messages then, with a friend of hers telling her that the world was in great danger of a catastrophe if we didn't change course. That was um, at the time of the um, invention of the atom bomb. We had a lot of messages then saying this was a, a terrible danger for the world and also for the human psyche, because it would split the human psyche by splitting the atom, because we're all connected with nature and with matter. And, and, and look at what's happening now, you know, it's just becoming yeah. more and more prevalent. So this is what we, I was brought up on these messages and they have been my guiding light all the way through my life because I trusted them absolutely. What they said made great sense. What they said is actually on my original website, if you want to look, it's called Channeled Messages. And um, so they said we should prepare. Well, my mother at that time had no idea how to prepare. How do I prepare? And they told us to look for a stone that is under a tree. So we began digging around different gardens, <laughs> trying to find this stone, which we, they said, the messages said, was connected with the dream of the water. Now, dream of the water is now a chemical saying, but I didn't know that until about 20 years ago. So, and what I realized, what it led me to was Kabbalah, the tradition of Kabbalah, and that the, the, the stone at the foot of the tree is the, the divine feminine in Kabbalah. So there we have it. And then I had a visionary dream of a cosmic woman whose body stretched from the earth to the sky. 
and which actually shook me rigid, as you might imagine. And she um, had a great a revolving wheel in her abdomen. And I was caught in a net looking up at her. And I saw that I had a similar wheel, but mine was on the left. And she indicated to me, center your wheel. So that's what I've been doing, which is becoming more conscious of the divine feminine. That's what the message was. So that, in a nutshell, is kind of my, my background, which is very varied and very fascinating for myself anyway, and which has led me to my work on the rescuing this feminine archetype and bringing it back into the world by whatever means I can. Absolutely. And, and you said, like with your book, it took you, this particular book, you've got a few books, but this particular book, The Dream of the Cosmos, this was yes. 20 years in the yes, making. Yes. Yes. And what I loved uh, listening to you talk about was how in that tw those 20 years, it was quite a solitary life because to yeah. withdraw, to receive the wisdom, but also to do, obviously to do the research and pull together all your life experience right. and insights. And I just wonder if you can go back to prior to the book, bringing it together and, and then, you know, fast forward to now, or it may be even sort of prior to even, you know, when you were younger, that the finding the voice bit, finding your um, way of expressing this and bringing, um, bringing forwards all those messages. I mean, it sounds like you were tuned in from a very young age anyway, and yes, you trusted. I did, but, but for many years, so maybe um, between the ages of 20 when I left university and 40, there was a, a period of getting used to life, getting married, having a child, bringing up a child and then a grandchild. So that took up a lot of time and energy. And I, in those years, I wasn't particularly, I was having a union analysis and I wasn't particularly preoccupied with my own creative life. Although I did have a shop in London called Troubadour, which sold beautiful evening dresses because people wore them in those days. And for 12 years, I did that. And then I trained as a Jungian analyst. And then I, after writing the book with Jules on the myth of the goddess, <clears throat> I met Andrew Harvey. And together we wrote The Mystic Vision, which was a lovely collaboration, and also The Divine Feminine. And we were supposed to write a third book called The uh, Sacred Marriage, but that never came off. So that was the sort of, and, and I also wrote a book for children called The Birds Who Flew Beyond Time which I love doing, and I did that after the myth of the goddess, and I wanted to tell the story of, of the search for human beings for the divine ground, if you like, and I told it in the form of that um, conference of the birds story, which is a Sufi story, in fact, but um, I changed it into a kind of modern uh, story about birds who go in search of helping the earth mm -hmm. <clears throat> and bring back a message from the great being over the edge of time and the message was that they were the messengers, so to speak. They were bringing back to the earth what needed to be done. And they just had to trust themselves. And I also said in it, um, tell the people of the earth, that the, the children of the earth, that there is no death. And that is something that I knew from a very early age. And this is something that I bring into my writing, because I have a whole chapter on that in the dream of the cosmos. So these all different strands and different threads and one of the messages said, um, don't worry about your past lives. Give us good thread. We do the tapestry. And I think that's such a lovely image of, of them stitching the tapestry with the threads that we give them. So we don't, have to t we don't have to worry about where we were in another life or what we did or anything to do with that, but get on with this life. And uh, well, what is our purpose in this life? And I knew my purpose after I'd finished those books, my purpose was to write, but I had to write on my own, not with anybody else. And I had to do it slowly. And by been, I had been giving a lot of seminars at that time. So I incorporated the seminars into the dream of the cosmos in many different ways, particularly the ones on alchemy and the ones on the historic uh, background to where we are now. Um, that was the first part of the book. And then I did one, two chapters on misogyny and the myth of the fall, which is coming up so much now in our culture and needs to be addressed urgently, which has crept in with, material, with scientific materialism, I think. The mm -hmm. two have come together, that, that the disrespect for women and the disrespect for the earth 
have gone together with the idea that we are virtually just um, atoms in a cosmos that has no meaning. Mm, with no connection and yeah, it's... No, no connection, no responsibility. Yeah. And that we're just here, breathe with it, and then we go, when the brain dies, we die, which is a terrible uh, thing to tell people because it's totally untrue. But because it's so difficult to prove the other things, um, we're stuck with it at the moment. And also we've got this, um, the rational mind. So there's a, you know, I can see it working in my own psyche at points where um, I would be um, almost questioning myself. Well, is that true? How can that be true? You can't prove it. So I can hear the two sides of the, the soul speaking mm -hmm. and then I can feel the, um, the voice of where we're at wanting the answers to prove it yeah that's uh, the spirit of the times it is yes and that's the slower one is the spirit of the depths and yes. you have to you can't do away with the spirit of the times because we have to live in this world and we have to negotiate our, our sort of relationship with the world as it is um, unless we withdraw into a forest or something so it's important not to ignore the ego which has its own role but the ego has in the end to be um, the servant of the self, what Jung called the self. Yes. And so it has to move from being master in his own house to being servant. Yes. And you open one of your chapters with a quote from Albert Einstein uh, about the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. The rational mind is a faithful servant. Mm -hmm. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. That's a brilliant quote, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, chapter 14 that was in. Mm -hmm. um, and as you've got along on your own particular journey with all of this, I'm just wondering what challenges you've come up against it as a woman uh, writing about these things, bringing the soul forwards in such a, um, in such a way. Um, well, my first book was virtually ignored, <laughs> although it did sell. 3,000 copies, but in, in the press and, you know, got no notice at all. And Dream of the Cosmos has never been mentioned. The Myth of the Goddess should have had a prize, but um, it was um, superseded by the marvelous book that Jung Chang wrote um, on China, on, on the experience, I can't remember its name now, Wild Swans, that's what it was called. So I, I didn't begrudge her that at all, but it unfortunately put the myth of the goddess into the shade. And we've never had any recognition in England for that book. We've no, had no academic recognition. And in America, we have had, because it's a, um, it's a classic course book in some universities there, including the um, Pacifica Graduate Institute. But um, it's been a hard struggle. Jules and I have often said to ourselves, you know, why is it so difficult in this country to get anything through which is, has any depth to it? Why is there such a sort of um, blanket censorship, really, on the books like mine, which were very well written and could have been accepted by the academic world? So there, there is a sort of bitterness there, but there's also understanding that we live in the world that we do and that I just have to get on with my work and not get worried about it or not get depressed or discouraged by it. And so I've, and bringing up a, a dyslexic daughter and grandson was extremely difficult because no school would have them, no private school would have them for a while until it was easier with the grandson because we got him into something. But that affected um, one's um, really trust in, in life because everything was so difficult. Um, and it was very difficult to, as a parent, to carry the burden of having two children who had great difficulties mm. and who would have difficulties in life if one couldn't give them a stable foundation, which we did. Um, and they're okay now. My daughter is a riding school teacher and has her own big riding stable, so she's fine. And the grandson is only 25, so he's just, he's a farmer in touch with the earth. And um, so they're okay, but it was, you know, we had to focus for maybe 30, 35 years on those two lives, and that took a lot of energy. Mm. Yes, I have a daughter who's 10 who is, um, you know, she goes to bed with these questions of why am I here? What am I here to do? <laughs> and uh, it's, it's such big questions, and it's what, you know, we, we spend a lot of time out in the woods. She calls us the Wood Sisters, and 
she'll name particular trees and how you know raising a raising a daughter um in in these times it feels like an exciting thing to do but also you know she's fierce and wild and wonderful and it's trying to encourage that but also to channel it into what what will serve her best and um structure of some kind she will need but she's very, she's very young still so there's plenty of time for that and you'll help her which is wonderful because that is the question that every child should ask what am i here for what what is my gift that i can give to the world and and, and that's it is what can i give to the world there's this um uh, relationship of thinking what can i do for rather than all about the me and the you know i spent a long time doing things even though i was doing things there was also the ego you know side of it okay how am i going to become i you know being brought up in this society that i'm in and we are in of like you know the competition i wouldn't say i was competitive but it was like okay there's a strive and a drive and it's about getting to the top of your game mm-hmm. which created burnout for me uh, even though i was teaching yoga at the time i was you know not being paid particularly well but running around doing something i loved because i the soul was very happy but then um realizing i i was buying into a um a particular way that wasn't going to serve uh, mm. the being well, necessarily lessons that one learns as one goes along which is the best way to do it how do i earn my living when i'm following my heart that sort of thing but i think if you ask the right questions you are guided <clears throat> absolutely i totally agree and I, and i and that connection to being guided and to listening to the messages that come through and to um and just to come back to that connection into uh, source self soul remembering that you are not just on your own yeah absolutely yeah. and and that we're all part of one great huge enormous um unbelievable life Absolutely. I was listening to you talk um about Indra's net as well. Um to Andrew Harvey on a on it was on oh, YouTube. Yes. Yeah, and um it reminded me when uh, about um probably 7 years ago I went over I had this great calling to go to Sri Lanka and so I went and on the first day I was there I had this treatment with somebody and i went to another state of consciousness my mum had died in the previous couple of years and before we began the the practitioner said oh your mum's just given you a great gift anyway so i carried on with this treatment and i went off into this other place and um all i could see was like a spider web with um all these sort of water droplets on it and i didn't know about indra's net or this web of consciousness you know in my conscious mind and uh, and then i heard my mum's voice saying i'm fine i'm on another plane i'm fine and of course when you sh- I, i don't didn't share it far and wide but when i told certain people you could see the kind of oh is she okay kind of thing but then i also have a group of people that would totally understand and then i found out about indra's net and of course web of consciousness and all this connection i was like oh that's what that was how incredible such a beautiful image too it's much better as an image than the vacuum than the quantum vacuum which doesn't have an image with it but in this net immediately you can see all these scintillating diamond like um, connections really yes so yes. i i love that image and i found that when i went to india discovered that yes um and then the shekina became shekina, yes became huge well is important because the shekina is the holy spirit and she is the holy spirit that was lost in christianity when in 325 the bishops decided that there should be a father a son and a holy spirit all male and so they didn't i don't know how it happened it may have been just in the translation of a hebrew word into greek or greek into latin i'm not sure i can't prove anything but anyway that's when it changed so christianity had a um a trilogy of males the female principle is just gone except for the virgin mary who was um taken up as it were into heaven in a papal bull of um 20 no 194 1950 and 1954 and she was made queen of heaven but it's not the same as the holy spirit and so i'm working on i'm just going to have a 
chapter published in America on it in a book on all the divine wisdom feminine traditions from different cultures, which is very nice. And I that chapter three in my book about the whole Kabbalistic imagery of the Shekinah and divine wisdom and the Holy Spirit was just mind blowing. It was almost as if I took it down in a channeled messages form, but I didn't. I got it from a great scholar called Gershom Sholem, who was the greatest scholar at the time I was writing that book. So, um, but that she is my guide and she is what I saw in that cosmic vision. Well, she wasn't a goddess in the normal sense at all. She was the feminine principle or the divine aspect of deity. Mm. And that was why it was so powerful. And this is the, the vision you were talking about with the um, the woman that was huge. Yes, yes. Woman, with yeah. the wheel, yes. And, and that the wheel was the whole cosmos, really, in, yeah. her, in her stomach. And I had this tiny wheel in mind, which was a, I was a copy of her. And of course, I was just thinking of talking to somebody yesterday in the first chapter of Genesis, God makes man and woman in the image of himself and herself. It's not mentioned, herself isn't mentioned, but that is the meaning of it. And then in the second chapter of Genesis, we have the dreadful story of the fall, where the tree of life becomes two. We have tree of life and tree of knowledge. And that myth was written in 621 um, BCE by a group of priests who took over the first temple in Jerusalem and banish the goddess, banish divine wisdom and the Holy Spirit. So that was deleted. But I think Kabbalah is the tradition from that first temple. I can't prove it because Kabbalah came much later, even a thousand years later. But I think that this is what was saved by the Jews who probably left Jerusalem and went to Alexandria. And they were a big Jewish community in Alexandria. And I think that is where this tradition from the first temple was, as it were, saved and nourished and eventually came through in the teaching of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. So that is what I've been working on recently. I'm not writing a book about it, but I put some things into my uh, talks on my um, website. And they, they were bringing back the wisdom, the lost wisdom tradition of shaman, shamanic um, connection with the other world healing, the power to heal directly and, and immediately, and the teaching that we are all one and that we are our brother's keeper. It might be useful to speak about what the feminine principle is, because for some people there seems to be confusion around uh, when, you know, the masculine and the feminine is discussed and then it becomes this sort of gender um, it, conversation when it isn't. Yeah. So it'd be lovely to maybe speak to that. Well, the feminine principle is about relationship, first of all. That is its primary characteristic. It's about relationship with the earth, relationship with the cosmos, relationship with every bit of the life of the earth and with all human beings on the earth. So that is its primary quality or character. And that's really all, basically all you need to know, but incorporated in that is all the wisdom traditions that were part of the divine feminine teaching going right back to Egypt. It has nothing whatsoever to do with gender. No, no. So yeah, it's an important conversation, I think, uh, just to clear up because there does seem to be confusion. Um, and it's also about compassion. Mm. Its primary mode of activity, if you like, is compassion or love or caring caring for the life of the planet, caring for each other, caring for all the different races and, and people that we are on the earth, you know, that we're, we're all children of the divine being, all of us, no matter what our color, our creed, or our gender. And mm -hmm. this hasn't really begun, to, it's beginning, just beginning, with the, uh, perhaps with the Black Lives Matter, but it hasn't really begun in relation to the Eastern people, the Chinese, Japanese, and, and the, you know, the Eastern people, or the indigenous people, or the um, what, people of any color skin whatsoever. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're all children of God, all children of the divine. Uh, yeah, 
Yes, and and it's about recognizing that divinity within each and every one of us. And you know, it, it this you know we were you were talking earlier about how we were made in the image of God. We yeah. In, this this journey here is uh, is about recognizing our own divinity and the other. Absolutely, and th this is what has been been lost in Christian teaching and also in all the other teachings except the Hindu one that we are part of the divine and that we carry divinity as um, it's even been placed in the one of the hemispheres of the heart. I can't remember which one, but Sri Ramana said that the divine element is carried in the heart. So we carry this and we have to become conscious of it, not by going around blessing everybody, but by behaving with compassion and, and love and realizing that we all carry this divine principle, including the animals. I mean, no, nothing is excluded. Even the, even the blade of grass, as it says in one of the marvelous texts from early Christianity, not, not from the Orthodox tradition, but from the um, Essene Gospels, it speaks of the grass as being holy. <laughs> mm. and, and it's in these indigenous cultures and shamanic traditions where this, this is honoured, you know, it's, it's known that with every foot you're killing something, with every footstep something is, is dying, but there's, a, there's, a, there's an honouring of that and, and um, blessing food or the crops or even just acknowledging um, one another in a, in a sacred way is there, it, is a, it still exists. <laughs> And it's in, in, in our culture, in this culture that's happening now, there's just this, uh, you know, from entitlement to complete poverty and abject, you know, that there's such a, a broad range of what, what is happening and this split that we, you were speaking about at the bottom, you know, just to watch how this split has become so extreme. And we've also in this culture forgotten our, there's a, there's a, Certainly, where where I, you know, there's this uh, entitlement and well, consumerism. Yeah, what, what what else is there if you take away any meaning in life and any relationship with something deeper? Mm. All you're left with is how can I get more for myself? Yeah. Or how can I be more powerful? Or how can I be more rich or more famous? You have all the celebrity culture, which is just ludicrous, and so people try and aspire to being like. Um, Kardashian or whatever her name is, I can't remember. Oh, Kardashian. <laughs> yeah. So they, they have they, they take these models and they model themselves on it. And so they want to have a bigger bottom or bigger breasts or bigger this or bigger that in order to be like their model. And the men um, aspire to being rich and famous like um, Elon Musk or um, what's his name in Amazon? Um, what do you want? What is his name? I can't remember. I can't remember. <laughs> but, you know, I for me, I feel like we're all born with this long, no, from the separate, well, the separation from the divine, but remembering we are divine. There is this longing and there's this aspiration that comes and it gets muddled up within yeah. this wider context of thinking, oh, we need this. And then, no, that's not it. If you're just, even if you got there, you'd still be feeling like uh, separated or lost, I think, I think. Unless you find your creativity. If you can find your creative gift, then you're okay. Mm. If you yeah. don't do that, then you just hang around copying people or trying to be better than you are, which is not the right way to go about it, really. No, and it's all about giving you, you're still giving your power away in some ways rather than recognizing your in inherent you know, creativity and, yeah. and the power mm. that you hold within. Even following a guru is not a good idea anymore because gurus can be, um, have feet of clay as well. Which has been, we've been finding out in the last mm. years or so. So it's better to just trust your own soul and ask your soul or your heart, because the heart actually is the organ which is connected to the soul and the right hemisphere of the brain. And ask your heart, what would it really like to do in life? What would make it feel really as if it had come here to do something and it was happy having found that work and being able to put your heart into something you love? It could be even as simple as loving your cat or your dog. It, it just needs to find expression in small ways, and then it can grow. I mean, I've seen how my own life has, has grown um, without my being aware of what was happening, really, until I had finished that book. And then I realized, well, you have done something. You have given your gift. 
and um, you've done it to the best of your ability. Mm. And and some people would say that, um, you know, because the world is in such peril, in such a crisis, that it could seem selfish to want to fulfill that need within you. And my impression is that actually to um, to find what that is, to find your purpose and your meaning, loving your cat, that is part of this um, gift yes. back to the world. Expanding your circle of love, to, starting perhaps with cat or dog and then expanding from there. Yeah. Or, or children, obviously. Yeah. But and it, I, it comes if you, if you wait for it and look for it, it, it comes. And not necessarily from the mind, definitely not from the mind. It will come from in heart. here. It has to come. We have to move from the head to the heart. That's the biggest step we've got to do now and as quickly as we can. Already thousands and thousands of people are doing that. And there's a marvelous um, thing every day called Humanity Rising, whereby um, the head of Ubiquity University, a man called Jim Garrison, invites people to come and speak with him every single day since last May, so that's nearly a year, who are engaged in this work and who understand this work. And so he's had all kinds of people from activists to poets to shamat shamans to all every kind really speaking about their longing for a different kind of civilization mm. and a different way of living on the planet. Mm. So we're not alone. There are tens of thousands of people and there are people in China, in India, South America, Australia, New Zealand. Well. We are in a great time of transition, aren't we? And I think this pandemic that has happened has woken up even more people. Um, and uh, you were speaking in something about Ken Wilber, and, and this was a few years ago, um, giving this percentage of like, we need about 10% of the people to wake up. It doesn't have to be everybody, because otherwise it could feel like, oh, I'll never do this in time. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels like there is that. And I, I just wonder what the percentage might be now, because I do feel there's been a big shift in yeah, I think I it's growing all the time and it's growing exponentially, increasing by geometric progression, not, not arithmetic progression. So it is growing and we're being helped from people on the other side. And um, I think it, it, will, it will come about because it will accelerate as we've only got 10 years to stop using fossil fuels and get out of this whole old paradigm, as it were. And as that happens, Science may make new discoveries about this other world, this is ex existence of other dimensions. Um, we may have all sorts of things that can happen in this time because of the pressure. Hmm. And yeah. Jung said, I remember, that when things have gone too far in one direction, they have to swing back to the center, so to speak. So I think this is what's happening now. And we can trust it. It's not something that we need to be frightened of. And it's not good to be too depressed about what's happening in the world because there's going to be a lot worse happening. People are going to be fighting each other. There are going to be shortages. There are going to be people, millions of people trying to move from the south to the, um, to the more um, colder climates, as it were. So there's going to be a lot of suffering. And mm -hmm. we have to face it, know that it's coming, but not be completely swallowed up by depression or fear. Well, this is also um, the, the building up resilience within your, you know, your life, but also your, you know, this heart, the love, the kindness, the compassion, growing that and um, in, in the little ways that you can around you and to build the community and simplifying life down as much as you can. As much as you can, yes, that's absolutely true. It yeah. is to do when one is old because there's not much to do. I mean, we can't travel anymore. <laughs> And so we and we can't even go to London because we're too old. So we just stay in our little sitting room and, and read and talk mm. and uh, do Zoom meetings. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, that sounds quite similar to my life right now. I'm quite. I've adjusted quite quite well. Um, uh, but um, I was going to speak about something around um, reconnecting with our bodies. And. For me, it feels like because the divine feminine, the feminine principle was sort of written out almost and ignored for such a long time, there has been this um, need to reconnect into, you know, spirit to matter, light. We, we are light in our body. You know, we have light in our body. We and, are. and We are light. We are light. That's better. Yes, thank you. Exactly. We are light. And there's this 
need to reconnect into the body to become embodied and and you talked about you know the head to the heart is the most important journey and I also feel like down into the hara the womb space you know there is this journey that seems to be happening of going down into the body and really seeing what's there uh, for people and and being with the body and feeling it again because it almost feels like we got cut off at the 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 neck at some point because we were just running in our heads um i don't know what you think about that i mean well i think there are a tremendous amount of therapies going on to do with that reconnecting with the body and knowing that the body is an absolute miracle in itself but because we need a body in order to incarnate on this planet but the body itself is, is a most fantastic organism, a miraculous organism of all the different organs working together without our having to do anything about it. I mean, think of what's the, your liver, your heart, your gut, everything working together without your being aware of it, really. So anything you can do to help the body feel better or feel happy is, is very good. And what has been a terrible, um, for me, a great sadness, is the abuse of the body, the sexual abuse of the body, uh, which is so much the fashion in this culture. But it, it's an absolute, um, I don't know what really, it, it's just to go against all the teaching of the law of life to treat the body in that way as something that we can use for our own gratification, rather than something which is a miracle, which when you meet up with, a, with another human being and, and share the experience of love and sexual union. That is a sacred um, experience. It's not something that you can have a one night stand and, and you know, whatever. So I, I'm disgusted by the sexual innuendos and focus of the culture in all the papers, because sex sells the papers. So they, every day there's a new picture of a sort of half naked woman. And women have been the worst contributors to that, writing books about their sexual experiences and how marvelous the number of men they've slept with is. All this um, rubbish. And the, the sacredness is gone. There's the, there's... It's gone, but it never was there because it was never there in Christianity. That's the problem. Right. It was right. never there right the way through because a woman was really dirt compared to a man. Mm. A woman was just a vehicle for a man's seed and she had no value in herself, and the body had no value, and the soul was neglected, but they have spoken about it. Do you feel like in, um, say, in other traditions, though, there was more of a respect for that sacred union, um, perhaps in the Indian culture? Well, in the Indian tantric um, um, tradition, yes, but, but only really in the tantric, I would say. Mm. Because there's a lot of abuse in India as well. There's terrible rape in India, appalling rape and murder every day. And there's no justice for women there whatsoever. No. So India is one of the worst places to be a woman, although you can rise to great heights if you're an educated woman. But the lowest caste, the Dalits, have a, a terrible time. And, and that is where the, the weakness of these religions comes out in, in the way they've treated women. That's, that is the proof of the pudding. And that goes for Islam as well. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's very. Tra it's it's a travesty and it's tragic to to consider what's going on right now all over the world. And then we bring in the sex trafficking and it's it's um, how we got to this place is it's clearly well, stated in your book actually if you look at the history of it. But it's it's. I mean, I st I'm stunned sometimes because I just think, how is this happening? Well, it's happened because of money. Because of money became the, the one thing that everybody wanted. And, and as the, there was an absence of any other value, money became the supreme value. And so anybody who could acquire money or use people in order to make money, that became the norm, not the norm, because there are plenty of people who don't do that, but the worst aspects, the pornography, for instance, I don't know who makes money out of that, but somebody must be. Yes, they do. It's a huge industry, isn't it? It's an, an, and yeah, it's... That has corrupted all the young men in our culture who are then treating women in the way they see on the films. That is, to, to me, a catastrophe. And people believe that they, they, they need to act a certain way or be a certain way, whatever gender they are, um, because of this portrayal of, 
oh this is how it works and then the the there is no sacredness there is no sensuality left yeah. it's it's all being cut off and that's it's um no it's... whatsoever mm. yeah. no, it's all it's all performance and um mechanical behavior really yeah and so destructive to the soul and just cutting yourself literally just you know cutting yourself short and oh it's it is I awful think maybe it d done about it but i don't know quite how and personally i think facebook is a disaster because i've resigned from it mm. I, I think it's it's corrupt at its core and i think it's dangerous because it gets too many people open to what they are saying and believing and you know they they open themselves to exploitation the whole time yes and, and then i suppose coming back to this connection just um to instincts you know we've we've learned it i mean i don't know how to so solve the world problems um but there does seem that if we can get more in touch with our heart with our instincts with listening to ourselves this stands us in our own stead, in our own power to, you know, bring out our creative exploits, but also to understand how to interact with those around us and what to do in our relationships. Yes, because instinct has been very maligned and neglected, really. But the problem is that, Jung, as Jung saw it, he said that if you get cut off from your instincts, they take you over. And this is what has happened. It's because we haven't got a relationship with the planet and, and with the cosmos and with our own instinctive nature, um, we are open to being taken over and driven by those powerful instincts of um, wanting to have security, which is behind the, the, the need for money. And so we're in survival mode the whole time, rather than in the um, relationship mode of knowing that everything is all right and that we'll be looked after and that we don't have to struggle and um, fight for our corner, so to speak, pushing other people out of the way or attacking other people or um, wiping other people out with nuclear weapons or whatever. That's another thing that I'm very, very concerned about. Absolutely. I mean, that's just... But, but that is an example how the instinct can take over the negative instinct and drive us towards goals which are disastrous and with cat catastrophic effects on both the planet and on people, you know, how many million people would die in a nuclear um, mm -hmm. weapon. Yeah. Um, so that's, I, I think it's important to think about instinct and, and try and separate the threads of where we're being driven by it and how we need to connect with it, the two aspects. And choosing what you're influenced by, yeah. as in... You know, people you are with, you know, less time on social media. Um, there's so many things, you know, whether you're engaging with the news all the time and actually, you know, it sounds, mm. I like the sound of humanity rising. I'm going to look into it. But it's like, what do we surround ourselves with? And um, well, that's it. What, what do we accept as normal when it isn't normal at all? Yes. So you had some, you, you, you did some, um, uh, you included some work with the Heart Math Institute, which is in your book, which I encourage people to go and have a look at and to read and to bring yeah. those practices in. How to focus on the heart or through the heart every, every day, really, how to begin your day focusing there. And right. to bring coherence in so that, yeah, really, we're looking for coherence in the body as yeah. well through right. this. Yes. Mm. Now, they've done an amazing work there, very, very, very valuable work. But there are many other ones. There's a Chinese um, whole thing of Qigong and, and how to use and understand Qigong as a method of healing the body and also harmonizing one's self with the deeper aspect of life. The Taoists knew so much and they've been so neglected by modern China, by the leaders of modern China, um, who are completely taken over by the power thing. And they really are forgotten the wisdom that's there in their country. It's such rich wisdom. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know too much, but um, I, I've tapped into you know friends that have that practice qigong, and I've practiced it with them, and 
uh, I'm quite a somatic person, so I feel it in the body, and I can feel the the powerful energies running through as you as you work with that method. And you know, we have all the technologies here. <laughs> we have all that we need, but they're not. I think it would help in schools if children did meditation every morning just for ten minutes. Yes, I agree. Down, and then if they were taught to about this relationship and how we're all brothers and sisters. They, you could teach children in four, five, and six ages yeah. to have this attitude towards other people before they even start. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I totally agree. I mean, I do see meditation coming into schools more and more now. Um, you know, we are. It does feel like things are starting to move on as things are going to start to get more, even more intense. And lots of people have found this last year intense. But you know, I, it's. Um, it's looking after our children, isn't it, and helping them? Yes, absolutely. This this year has been very difficult for, particularly for your age group and for for um, university students' age group. Very difficult because they've been shut up just when they need to be going out and meeting people and, and to ha you know having a good time in university. But we've learned a lot, and also I think David Attenborough has a program tonight on something called Apple TV, which I've never heard of. Have you heard of Apple TV? I've heard of it. I haven't been on it, but it's something to do with the Mac book, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, he's speaking about how nature has recovered during the pandemic, how animals and birds have recovered, how the lack of airplanes and cars and everything has helped the environment. So he's apparently talking about that. If I can find what Apple television is, I'll try and tune in. <laughs> yes, yes, do. I, I can't help you there. <laughs> but I noticed that um, how blue the skies were looking and how loud the, the birds got. And um, yeah, I'm look, oh, that'd be good. I'll keep an eye on that. Um, but, you know, it just goes to show how quickly it can recover if we stop mm -hmm. interfering. Yeah, we could recover. We've even got a squirrel who comes every morning. He, he's very clever. He jumps from a roof onto one of the bird feed stands. And then he just nibbled his, his way through whatever he can get before I come after him. <laughs> that's another thing that's happened. The relationships people have built with what's going on around them, certain trees, you know, following the whole pattern. Because quite a lot of people will go away maybe in the winter, um, certainly the ones that I know, or, or they're not at home, they're too busy, and, and meet myself included in this. And then just to watch the whole cycle of the trees coming in to blossom now and losing their leaves in the autumn, and, and to watch that, and, and um, you know, generally people have been going for walks in the same areas, so they're noticing things that they would not have noticed before, and that feels like a real gift. It is a gift, and also lots of them are planting um, vegetables and gardens and things. Apparently, yes. there's been a huge rise in, in people um, buying seeds and things. Yes, yes. There was something, um, I don't know if you know of Embercoom. Have you heard of Embercoom? Mm -hmm. They were just sharing, um, what was his name? Let me just get the name. It was quite a lovely, Crucial Wisdom from Bill Mollison. And he was talking, he's given some points, learn to plant, um, not just an orchard, but basic crops. And he goes down, let me scroll down. Exchange, store, multiply and spread Creole seeds, native, not genetically modified, produced by popular and family farming. So there is this, you know, it's to help us in this transition, um, create a bond with some land, whether it's yours or that of a relative, community garden, etc. It's, um, it's a nice little... It is uh, nice. And there's a young man just in front of our garden starting an organic... Um, vegetable growing um, farm really so he, he's he's 28 or something like that so he's the generation that will change things and he's already incredibly clued up and knows all about these organic gardens that are being built for instance in France as a marvelous place in Normandy that is just a small acreage but it has almost like a forest and within the forest it's got chickens it's got vegetables it's got fruit trees it's got everything you need all very close together so they all nourish each other they all interact with each other and he's written a book about it which i've just got and that that is exciting agriculture is going to change it's going to have to change from the huge agricultural um, companies that you know have huge acreage and huge Absolutely. machines yeah. it's got to go back to small holdings small yes. farmers yes. and somebody called Colin Tudge who's written a wonderful book um, oh dear whose name I've forgotten but anyway 
he's um, he's very influential in the agricultural field. He's promoting this idea of small gardens. I think so. And Mary Reynolds, do you know Mary Reynolds? I've heard of her, yes. Yes, and she took, she's got a book called, I think it's called The Garden Awakening, and it doesn't matter how big, this. she gives you ideas and tips and how important this relationship to the land, and she's a real um, voice in this. She's Irish, um, a real activist in this field, and mm -hmm. um, I live down in Brighton, so um, I help out at our local organic gardening group allotment, because um, it's quite hard to get an allotment down here, but... Um, <laughs> You know, I see I see the life there, you know, all the different age groups, you mm. know, and they really encourage the children to come along. And of course, you've got the knowledge that's passed through from mm. the different age groups and different, you know, sort of levels of experience, mm. which feels very exciting. That sounds wonderful. Lovely. And also your daughter can be introduced into that. Yeah, and she loves it. And learn a lot that way. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so then, um, thank you. It's been really nice to speak to you today. Um, but we've covered a lot. <laughs> hmm? we, we have covered a lot. Yes, yes, I, I suspected we might. Um, and just in closing, uh, you ask um, the four great questions um, with the challenge that we're in. So I just wanted to read them out um, and give the listener something to consider. Okay. How do we recover our lost sense of being part of something totally sacred? How do we develop respect and compassion for the life of the earth in all its forms? How do we find ways of meeting the deepest needs of the human heart for love, relatedness and connection? And how do we relinquish the beliefs and patterns of behaviours that have been so damaging to both soul and body as well as to the planet? Mm. Mm. That sums up. It does, yeah, yes. Mm. Yes. And thank you so much. It's been such a joy. Lovely to talk to you, Kirsty. Thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure. Yes, Happy. likewise. All right. Okay, I'll say goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>